Thank you to SUFC for inviting us to present on our Across the Fence Lines project today. My name is Margaret O'Gorman. I am the president of the Wildlife Habitat Council, and um, we've been involved with SUFC, SUFC for many years, one of our favorite collaborations. I'll be joined later with my colleague, by my colleague Patricia Billett, and my other colleague Danielle Goldfarb is also in the audience, ready to step in at any stage. But what I want to do first is set a context. To Wildlife Habitat Council, we've been working at the intersection of business and nature for three decades. And what's significant about our work is that we operate in a vertically integrated way with companies. We work from the C-suite of, of corporate leaders who are developing strategies for conservation that help them meet a variety of business needs. We work with senior management and operating companies that help them translate the C-suite conservation priorities into actionable items for operating sites. And then we work with sites themselves to support implementation and recognize efforts through our voluntary sustainability standards conservation certification. So that this graphic shows that we work across the value chain. So the value chain from the extractive industries right through to the end, in essence, what we work with, we can follow a mined commodity through processing, manufacturing, use, and into recycling or landfilling. And each company on the value chain is a traded, is a traded stock on the stock exchange. It's a contributor to the economy. It's an employer. But most importantly for us at WHC, it's a physical presence in a community. And that's where this project really started. You know, for most publicly traded and large companies, the distance between the physical presence and the stock exchange is vast. But in corporate offices, it's the shareholders, the ESG, environmental, social and governance and financial rating agencies that have the power to drive the change in behavior. So what we try to do is bridge that gap. So recently, um, these shareholders, these ESG rating agencies, in the absence of significant government action on climate change, these stakeholders have driven change by encouraging companies to set commitments for carbon reduction, which has in turn driven many companies to frame forestry pro their forestry programs in that way. So most companies approach decarbonization in a variety of ways addressing their products, their processes, their materials, and their supply chains. But when they run out of operational improvements and product innovations, they look to offsets, making investments and actions that reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. And one of the preferred offsets um, driven by the private sector is in reforestation. It's driven by high profile initiatives like the Trillion Tree Campaign and others, which have in turn driven companies to adopt goals like um, the oil giant Shell is committing to plant a billion trees through a global investment of $300 million. Amazon's $100 million is dedicated to reforestation and conservation and AstraZeneca has a goal to plant 50 million trees by 2025. These are all delivered by third parties or grantees. But what the goals miss most is the chance for communities to participate in private sector investment in forestry. Those goals miss the opportunity to slice off a part of that $300 million investment to actually invest in the communities in which the operations are having impact. Now, you know, global car manufacturer, there are exceptions. Global car manufacturer Toyota is an exception because they have adopted the culture of um, Marissa Cori, which means to create a forest, which is leading their local operations across their global footprint to engage in microforests. But in general, companies' massive and global tree goals um, have a massive and systemic blind spot. The places where they are investing are not the places where they're having an impact. So this is where our Across the Fence Lines pro project initiative comes in. 
So with funding from the US Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Challenge and Cost Share Grant, we developed initiative to probe the challenges and opportunities for urban and community forestry programs in what we call community first approaches to corporate conservation action. Now WHC first um, created community first approaches for corporate climate action by looking at climate mitigation and adaptation. And we initially framed the urban and community forestry work in climate because for us, even though biodiversity is our core mission, we sometimes have to wrap biodiversity up into the um, relatively palatable peanut butter of climate for companies to actually um, be attracted to it and, and pay attention. So we initially framed the urban and community forestry work in climate, but we broadened the frame to encompass the multiple co-benefits for people in nature realized by community tree action. And community first means that companies make large investments directly, not via offsets, and that they consider the communities in which they operate, on which they have an impact, and where they can um, create uplift for nature, community health, equity, and resiliency goals. We're not talking again about the million dollar headline making investments. We're talking about hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands of dollar investments. And we're not talking about a project that is distant to the source of impact, but proximate to it and addressing it directly. So we want to explore how to change the headline of super rich company makes million tree commitment to super rich company plants trees locally as part of their million tree commitment. You know, we want to bridge the distance between the C-suite decision makers and the factory floor. And we did it by exploring the different business cases for companies investing in urban and community forestry. We looked at seven different case studies, seven different models of implementation from different industry sectors in locations across the country. The case studies looked at collective and cooperative corporate impact of the community initiative in the Calumet region of Northwest Indiana and Northeast Illinois. And this was a relatively mature effort which brings diverse companies across their fence lines to plant trees on corporate lands like the ports of Illinois, but also in communities. We examined large scale land activation through urban and community forestry at Marathon Gardens that sees a single company deploy reforestation and other neighborhood greening efforts to secure social license to operate. In Arizona, we explored a nascent effort to bring industrial associations, trade associations, into existing urban forestry conversations towards eventual implementation. This was much earlier effort in terms of um, activating. We hope to be moving into an activation because of this conversation with the trade associations. We also went to New Jersey where we learned about an innovation in natural resources damages, damage settlements, whereby an investment by a responsible party, BASF, is going to lead to much needed green space in East Newark, New Jersey. And we also looked at um, employee community connections across the I-94 corridor in Detroit, Michigan, and a platform for green alley activation in the East Canfield neighborhood in Detroit. We then went to suburban um, Illinois, where we looked at Marathon's investment as community in forests for community outreach efforts in Robinson, Illinois. All of these case studies are on our website under the initiative, the, the address will be on our last slide. But these case studies really allowed us to illustrate that there are many different ways and drivers for business to engage in urban and community forestry efforts. And that the drivers are, are, are so diverse um, that they become operational, they become mainstream, and they become beyond philanthropy. And this was one of the things, one of the points that we really wanted to make with this project. And part of the project was this really cool research that we did, um, it's because we wanted to understand what makes the private sector tick, because it's essential. This is the key to collaborating with the private sector, is understanding how they tick. It's the key to going beyond philanthropy and building a relationship with companies. So, you know, the view of the private sector as a faceless behemoth with deep pockets and deeper sins is kind of lazy. You know, the corporate sector is made up of countless companies and these, each company is an ecosystem made up of operations. 
And they're all located in communities and they're all staffed by people who live in those communities. So understanding the difference in the distances and the different drivers and the community aspect, these are all key to um, really meaningful engagement. So at WHC, we have over 100 certified programs that include a forestry project. The majority of these forestry projects fall squarely within the definition of urban or community forestry. They're small scale, they're not managed for wood products. They create benefits for biodiversity and community. So as part of our, as part of this program, we analyze these certified forest projects and survey project owners to discover the drivers for action and the various alignments and partnerships. And as you can see from this infographic, 91% of the projects involve employees. And what that means is employees volunteering their time to plant, manage, and monitor the, the projects. 82% engage external partners from federal agencies, schools, and local and national NGOs. And for our certification scoring, we weight how much a project aligns with an existing conservation plan. Is their work aligned with the 10-year urban forestry action plan or the state wildlife action plan or at the global level with the sustainable development goals? 53% of our projects are. When we dig in to the alignments, when we see 53% of the projects reporting alignments, it reminds us the community canopy goals are not the main driver for business engagement. They're aligning with different types of conservation um, goals and opportunities, but there's also an opportunity existing for them to align with local canopy goals. But businesses have really engaged with urban and community forestry beyond that, beyond canopy goals, and for many reasons fighter remediation, stormwater management, fugitive dust abatement and even sound and sight barriers where, for example, General Motors chose to build a tree barrier at one of their big test tracks in Michigan instead of building a wall to keep prying eyes out of their, um, you know, their brand new cars and also reduce the noise on the neighborhood. But what was interesting for us was the divergence in opinion between corporate managers and site managers with respect to why they were engaging in urban and community forestry. Both of them were addressing biodiversity, which is a bias really in our system because that's what we asked them to do because we're the Wildlife Habitat Council. Both of them saw it as a land management or green infrastructure, nature-based solutions type of activity. But what was fascinating was that site managers viewed the reason for engagement as contributing to sustainability goals and performance, whereas corporate managers viewed it for um, contributing to community engagement. And this was really kind of upside down because site managers don't think about sustainability goals and performance and corporate managers tend to think community engagement is done elsewhere. But what I think the difference, I think what's going on here is that corporate managers really view trees and forestry programs that contribute to sustainability goals only when they're done on the large scale. And they don't view those local, um, those local implementation activities as contributing to sustainability goals and performance. So this is a real opportunity to get the private sector to think differently about local site-based urban and community forestry act activity. Now we have more work to do with this research and we hope one day to kind of delve into that divergence of opinions a lot more. But what it does show us loud and clear is that there's plenty of space for collaboration with the corporate sector in community forestry. There's plenty of room for partners to come in and there's plenty of opportunity to get companies to align their activities with local and regional canopy plans or with the 10 year action plan. So we explore tons of different um, collaborations. And um, as I mentioned before, my colleague, Patricia Billette, who's manager for conservation initiatives working out of Detroit is going to walk you through some of the types of partnerships and what we learned from the partnerships that we explored. Patricia. Thank you, Margaret. Yes, so as you can see on this slide and given the context that Margaret has provided for us, the completed pieces of this project were very collaborative in nature. The logos that you see here represent a wide diversity of corporate partners, 
What was interesting for us is that it doesn't only represent corporate partners that were already active within the WHC realm and within our certification framework. So alongside our nonprofit partners and our knowledge partners, you're going to see the logo of the companies with which we had somewhat latent relationships who re-engaged with us in a very active way as a result of the information about urban and community forestry that we were exploring and platforming. Across Fence Lines also served as the impetus for new partners to collaborate with us on a variety of scales from small to large. So not only did this project spark deeper and broader collaborations, but it provided a very holistic look at corporate engagement in UCF across a continuum of projects. Our case studies focused on vulnerable, highly impacted communities with projects in a variety of phases and on a variety of scales. And through this, we were able to incorporate lessons and insights from, for example, a small corporation initiating the very first planting steps for a small 10 tree planting near their factory, alongside the implementation considerations for an effort involving thousands of trees over a five-year time frame with a 15-year monitoring plan. We even looked at Mont Marathon Robinson as they worked to reactivate a 15-year-old planting site with the development of new place-based learning activities for their STEM outreach program. Across these scales, geographies, and project stages through working with this diversity of partners, we found a few key takeaways to be first recognition of the corporate landscape as dynamic and shifting. Not only our relationship with these corporations as a small nonprofit, but their internal dynamics, priorities, and their relationships to their surrounding communities are in constant evolution. We found flexibility and adaptability to be crucial, as well as recognizing that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to collaborating with the corporate sector. Second, the capacity to frame the conversation within the appropriate business driver was crucial. Understanding and speaking the language of corporate priorities, benefits, and costs allowed us to platform the potential of urban and community forestry to both understand and undertake facilitation of more voluntary action with these partners. So in conclusion, just on this partnership piece and with respect to new collaborations, the partners you see here on the screen facilitated the creation of free resources designed to continue connecting impacted communities to solution-oriented corporate leaders and introduce urban and community forestry to interested corporations so that it's very much, so the effort is very future focused with respect to new engagement opportunities for sustainable projects. The aspect of the collaboration that we touched on here also allowed across fence lines to serve as a successful leveraging mechanism that did result in an additional million dollars of funding committed to urban forest collaborations with the private sector. There is significant interest and appetite here, and we would love to have uh, anyone who's intrigued by what we've presented reach out as we continue to develop those continuing pieces of the project and add more. With that, I'll pass it back to Margaret to conclude uh, and introduce our question time. Thank you, Patricia. And, um, you know, this last slide really summarizes many of the things that Patricia has said. Um, and I think one of the key things that it's in WHC's DNA, because we've been working with the private sector for so long, is to really listen to what a business needs are and understand that there are various drivers for business engagement. They may not be your driver, but it's their driver. And they're the ones who have the resources, the land, the money. And if we can hear what their driver is, then we can really help to understand how to get them engaged in urban and community forestry. And you know, for us in conservation overall. So there's a number of products on our website that are also part of this collaboration we have a decision tree, a roadmap and toolkits that were developed to support any entity that wants to work with the corporate sector. These are ways to help think and put your you know, mindset in the mindset of the corporate sector. And we also plan to publish those resources on Vibrant City Labs in the near future so that they're broadly available to the community of practice. Now, I want to finish by thanking the US Forest Service for, for supporting this effort. We knew we had a wealth of experience and diversity of engagement across our organization, and it was a real thrill to be afforded the time and the space to do so. And also the leverage that Patricia mentioned that we've gotten out of this because of the US Forest Service investment in really getting our companies to think about forestry has been amazing. 
But the cherry on the top of this project, which was released just today, um, is a white paper. WHC um, has written and published a white paper sponsored by Ontario Power Generation. It's called um, yeah, the Trees at Work. <laughs> this is a long thing. Driving Conservation, Equity and Empowerment Through Urban and Community Forestry. Um, we are, as I said, we are just releasing it today. And it's the latest piece of leveraging that we've done with the funding from the Forest Service. And it features more case studies. It features many case studies from companies implementing community forestry programs, realizing a variety of benefits. We have case studies from Canada, in the US, from Kentucky to Florida, from the Dominican Republic and Colombia. So the paper is actually going to be, you know, um, distributed to about 10,000 of our members and member companies and you know all the people that we have, hopefully picked up by some of the business news um, aggregator services. And it's going to really help us to you know, push the messages that corporate tree initiatives can be community first. And really at the end of the day, corporate tree initiatives should be community first. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Margaret and Patricia. And you're joined on the screen with your colleague, Daniel. Probably just have time for one question. Um, I see lots of snaps out there and there's been a really robust conversation in the chat. And I just want to say our first presenters did a great job of modeling, answering what they could in the time they had in conversation and then following up with answers in the chat. So if there's one question that we can answer live in the moment. Anybody with a burning question? Lots of conversation about not just planting, but maintenance. So I, I have one if I could. This yep, is jump John. on in. Yep, go so, ahead, John. So this project, like others, is about planning and planting. Do you guys know any projects and or any corporate funding initiatives, hundreds of millions, that are dedicated to the maintenance and improved health of mature trees that we could talk about or, or changing these projects to include, like I wrote in the post, the, the first five to 10 years of maintenance so that the result of the project is at least the starting size of a tree providing benefits. Thanks, John. I'm gonna ask you all to do a brief answer to that and then you can always follow up in the chat. Thank you very much. So either Danielle or Patricia can take that. Yeah, I can quickly say that, um, uh, well, you have the company, the examples of the companies uh, dealing with um, uh, the, the energy companies. So we have companies in the project that participated, DTE and NISource included, both electrical provider, natural gas companies that are very much committed to managing the, the urban forest uh, where, they, where they work. But uh, we do, when we work with companies, we do ask them to submit to a, a long-term plan. And right now we've been working under a platform called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, and we follow a three-year management plan for companies to, uh, you know, attend to um, when they do that work. So, but other companies have, have a much longer commitment. And, and, it, and again, it depends on the company, it depends on the site, the city, et cetera. So we can provide more information about that. 